So what we do now um, is an addition to the PCA chapter. It's another example of uh, principal component analysis. And it's, yeah, it's kind of a typical example. Um, it's about image compression. Uh, uh, maybe we start with the next lecture. Uh, um, so what, what uh, uh, Andrew Ng used in his lecture was a database with 5,000 grayscale images, pixel images. If you look at, and here we have 100 out of these 5,000 uh, faces, and every image is a, a 32 times 32 bit. Um, yeah, and actually it's not bit, no, sorry, not bit, sorry. It's 32 times 32 pixel. And every pixel is not binary, it's grayscale. Yeah? Um, so every pixel is a floating point number. Yeah? Um, yeah. 5,000 such images. Every image has all together, oh, it's, uh, you see the fault again, it's not. Uh, Oh yes, it's pixels, it's not bits. Yeah, it's pixels. It's, every image has 1,024 pixels and 5,000 such pi uh, images. Uh, and now, uh, what he did is, he applied PCA to these images and extracted the 100 principal components. Yeah? Um, yeah, and this basically means it's a projection onto a 100 dim dimensional subspace. I mean, here we have a 1024 dimensional space, so we reduce, we project our data onto a 100 dimensional uh, subspace. Um, and this, I mean, this, there are many reasons to do this. One reason is just data compression, because storing so many images costs a lot of uh, storage. And maybe you want to store, for whatever reason, many images on a little smart card and there is not much storage on it. And maybe you need it for identification of faces, whatever, and you only have a, a small uh, storage device. Um, and then maybe, I mean, if if you don't lose much information with this projection, uh, this might be very helpful. Um, yeah, and um, yeah, maybe at this point we should, uh, shall we repeat a little bit the formulas of, of, of PCA? Maybe we just look at them. Uh, where do we have it? Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is actually, um, I don't know, uh, I mean, it is the equation, but it's nicer uh, here. This matrix S is the covariance matrix. It's the covariance matrix of our data. Yeah? So every image is actually a vector. Yeah? So one image is a vector of length 1024. Yeah? 1024 uh, floating point values. Every image is such a vector. And now we have 5,000 such vectors and we calculate the covariance matrix of all these data vectors. And the covariance, so uh, let me, uh, there is a chalk. Basic rate gibt es kein. Ah ja, da, okay, klar. Um, <coughs> covariance of Xi and Xj gives us the, yeah, the covariance, the correlation, the statistical dependence of these two variables. Yeah? And xi and xj are, I mean, look, if this is our pixel image, 
32 times 32. Then we transform this pixel image to a vector of uh, x1 through x1024 um, pixel values. And now the covariance gives us the st statistical dependence between two of these variables, which is the dependence maybe of this pixel with that pixel. Oh, no, let, let me take, for example, these two pixels. Um, and if these are faces, maybe this is the left eye and that's the right eye. And of course, there will be statistical dependence between the left and right eye. So the covariance value between such two pixels will be uh, positive and quite far from zero. Uh, whereas maybe between the eye and whatever, maybe the nose, there is not so much uh, statistical dependence. Huh? So the covariance matrix gives us information about the statistical dependence between uh, pixels. Yeah? And this information, of course, is relevant in order to compress such images. Yeah? And uh, yeah, I'm, I hope you are now not angry when I talk about image compression and you would say, oh, this is computer science again. At least it's, it's applied. Yeah? Um, okay. Um, now, this S is the covariance matrix, and now we are looking for... Um, we, we have to solve this eigenvalue problem for the covariance matrix. We are looking for the eigenvalues of the covariance matrix, and the, the highest eigenvalue is, the, is called the principal component of uh, the covariance matrix, uh, respective of our data. Yeah? Um, and then, but we don't only uh, take the, uh, the highest eigenvalue. Oh, sorry, did I say the highest eigenvalue is the principal component? This is not true. The principal component <coughs> is the eigenvector corresponding to the highest eigenvalue. And we cannot only take the first principal component, but the first n principal components. And now what Andrew Ink did with our data is he calculated, all his students, the 100 highest principal components of these data. Yeah? And that's what we see here. Yeah. Yeah, okay, ah, yeah, and I missed this last uh, item. Um, and then, so what he does is, he solves this eigenvalue problem, takes the 100 highest eigenvalues, and then does an, a linear transformation of all the images onto this 100-dimensional subspace. And, I mean, all those who attended the PCA uh, exercise know how to do this transformation. It's actually, you only use the matrix containing all the eigenvectors. This is the transformation matrix to the lower dimensional space. So it's, it's really easy to do this transformation. Um, and then you have a projection of your data on the lower dimensional subspace. Yeah? And this is I mean, it's maybe a little bit related to a JPEG compression because this is a lossy compression. You may lose information. Of course, I mean, you have 1,000 dimensional data and then you, uh, you reduce the number of dimensions by a factor of 10. You may lose information. And it depends. If these pixel images would be uh, perfectly random pixels, then you would actually lose 90% of the information. But because these are not random pictures, there is a lot of similarity, maybe it's possible to compress them by a factor of 10. And in order to see whether this is possible, the task was to project the data on the subspace 
and, and you may lose information. If you lose a lot of information, then doing the, the inverse transformation, uh, transforming the projected images back onto the 1024 dimensional original space, that would give you pictures where you could not recognize any faces anymore. Huh? And, but look at the result. Here you see the result. Maybe it's a, a little bit small now. These are the original faces. Then the faces, the pictures are transformed onto the 100 dimensional subspace and actually this subspace it wouldn't help us to show the images because you wouldn't recognize anything because it's a completely different space. But then doing the, the inverse transformation gives you now back in the 1024 dimensional space these uh, images and you see, I mean they are quite related if you compare these two or these two or these two or these two. I mean this is almost perfect. So you see uh, you can compress these images very well. Huh? Okay, and I mean Richard was this, I mean this was your exercise, that's what you programmed. So it's actually Richard's work. Yeah, he, did a, he did a good job here. Um, yeah, and here is one one of the images enlarged, which is supposed to be Bill Clinton. Um, this is the original image, and this is the reconstruction from the projected data. Yeah? And I don't know in which in which of the two images do you recognize Clinton better? Who would say it's the left? Who says it's the right? Nobody. Okay, so some information about Bill Clinton was lost in the 100 dimensions. Okay, and here, um, and here actually I have to ask Richard because I'm not uh, perfectly sure. I tried to call you yesterday evening but you didn't answer your phone. Um, so this is now 33, uh, 36 uh, images with the 36 principal components. And I don't know, I mean, th is this, or um, no, maybe this is the, the highest, uh, uh, the, the, the projection onto one dimension with the highest eigenvalue and then doing the inverse transformation. Is that what we have here? And this is the second highest eigenvalue and so on? Or is it that we start with the first principal component, then we add the second and the third? What is it? I don't remember if they are ordered. I think so, but I'm not sure. I mean, my question is, is the first question is every one of the pictures a projection onto a one-dimensional subspace? Or is it one dimension, two dimensions, three dimensions? No, each image is a principal component. It's only one component. I mean, that would mean you do a projection from 1024 dimensions onto one dimension only. No. I almost can't believe it. No, um, so I'm not sure, but I think one image is a principal component. So it's one component? Yes. Only? Yeah, that may be the case. So then the order, of course, because this is, I would say, um, uh, the best of the images. This means this is the, the highest eigenvalue, the second highest, the third highest, and this is maybe the uh, eigenvalue number 36. But maybe you can look at, at the uh, pictures and... I'm not sure if you can reason that way, but I even think that the first, one, the first, that is, that the first image is the first principle. So I was wondering too, but... Um, I can't believe. Maybe that says us that most of the information lies within, within this, like, um, within this area. Uh -huh. This is how the faces are always organized. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, okay, so here you, you really see the structure. There are two eyes, a nose, and a mouth. Huh? And maybe it's, well, it's, it's also quite nice here. Yeah, I mean, I would agree with you uh, that this is the first principal component, but then here and so on, I would think you add the second component, and here you add the third, and here you have an image with all 36 principal components. That's what I would expect. But, I mean, let's, let's leave this open for next time. And maybe, how about, Richard, could you send around this exercise to the students and then they could find out what it is? Yes, but these are the first 36 principal components. Every picture is only one dimension. Richard, let's, let's leave it open. But I, I mean, could you send this exercise around to the students? And to me too, please? Yeah? Oh yeah, I think that's, that's uh, quite a nice exercise. And, and also, let me tell you that the Octave programs are really short. It's a couple of lines. Maybe the most difficult thing is writing this little routine that reads the data, and once you have the data in Octave, I mean, it's solving an eigenvalue problem, and there is a built-in function, so you just ca calculate the eigenvalues and eigenvectors, and it's really easy. So the, the core is only one line. Yeah? One line which is eig of cov of the data. Yeah? That's it. Okay, yeah. Oh, sorry, what happened here? Sorry, yeah, that was yesterday evening. Uh, I don't know what... Oh, what happened with this slide? But it was, it was perfect yesterday evening. And now, sorry. Is it, how is it in the script? Is it, is it as unreadable as it's here? <coughs> okay, it's okay in the script. So, um, yeah, maybe let's, let's look into the script. Ah, sorry, this is number one. Yeah. Ah. Okay, ah, no. Okay, yeah, some questions about scalability. Um, I mean, this was done with 32 times 32 pixels, which is 1,000 pixels approximately per image. Would this work with one megapixel images also? That's the question. Yeah? And my answer is no. And why does, does it, uh, would it probably not work? Maybe it, it might work, but I guess it would not work. Huh? Um, and the argument is the following. Um, with one megapixel, it's, a, it's one million of pixels. So we have a one million dimensional space, okay? And we do have around 5,000 images. It's not realistic to have five million images. Yeah? If you would have five million images, maybe it would work. But we do have 5,000 images. And this means we have 5,000 data points in our one million dimensional space. Um, yeah, and look, let's consider having 5,000 data points. And 5,000 data points in a, higher, in a higher dimensional space 
would define a 4,999 dimensional um, hyperplane. Why? Uh, maybe we should make this clear on uh, a lower dimensional example. Yeah, let's take, a, take three dimensions. Huh? Our three dimensional space here. It's, yeah, this is only two dimensional. Um, and suppose in this three dimensional space we take three points. I mean, we can take two points on the blackboard. And now let's take this chalk here as, po as point number three. Yeah? And now these three points in the th three dimensional space define a hyperplane. Okay? Or if in two dimensional space, that's what we can do here, we take these two points. And then now these two points in two dimensional space they define a one-dimensional subspace. Yeah? So you see, if you have in a high-dimensional space n points, these n points define an n minus one-dimensional linear subspace. Yeah? Is this clear? Is it obvious? Doesn't uh, have uh, subspace go through the origin? You're, you're right. Thank you. Thank you for this remark. Yeah? You're absolutely right. And uh, I, I guess you remember this from the Gilbert Strang lectures. Yeah? Uh, so a subspace would actually be something like that. Yeah? So it is not a subspace. Sorry. I, I mean, I was thinking, should I say it? And, but it, I'm really happy about your remark. So it defines um, an n minus one dimensional hyperplane. And a hyperplane is different from a subspace because, I mean, we could call it an affine uh, subspace. So you have, it's, I mean, it's actually this, this would be a subspace, and then you have a shift away from the origin. Yeah? That's what, what's a hyperplane. Okay, let's talk about hyperplanes. Yeah? Okay, so n data points define an n, n minus one dimensional hyperplane. Okay, and that's what we have here. 5,000 data points in our one million dimensional space define a 4,999 dimensional hyperplane. Okay, what does this help us? Suppose we would have um, um, even less data points. Let's say five points. Only five points. Five points would define a four-dimensional hyperplane in our one million dimensional space. Okay? Um, and now the question is, how many principal components should we use? If we would use 100 principal components and we would um, project onto a, um, a five-dimensional space, no, sorry. Um, taking 100 principal components would be a projection onto 100 dimensions. Okay? But if we would have only five data points, then the problem would be extremely underdetermined. Look for such a hyperplane. A hyperplane is a linear function. It's like a1, x1, plus a2, x2, plus, and so on, plus a. Uh, m x m equal to some constant c. That's the definition of such a hyperplane. And such an m dimensional hyperplane has m open parameters. And in order to determine such m parameters, you would typically need m equations. 
which means M data points. Or, and that's what actually we do at the moment, we do function approximation and we can solve overdetermined systems with no problems. We know how to solve overdetermined systems. So when we have more than M data points, there is no problem. But you know that there might be a problem if we have less than so many data points. Look, I mean, if you have only one data point and you want to fit um, a straight line, then you're having a problem because there are infinitely many solutions. So, and that's the point why you should have much more data points then you have dimensions, okay? Now here, so we are talking about the one megapixel case. One million pixels, and the, I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting question. Is it realistic to project your one million pixels onto a 100 dimensional subspace? Maybe it even works, but this only works if there is a lot of redundancy in these images. Yeah? I don't know whether it works, uh, but I'm skeptic. Yeah? Um, because already, I mean, projecting on a 5,000 5, dimensional subspace would mean that we would have a compression of a factor 1 million defined by 5,000, which would be a compression of a factor 200. And that's a lot. That's a lot. I mean, um, typically JPEG compression doesn't give you this, and JPEG is an excellent compression. Yeah? And uh, so I suppose this would not work. Yeah? But back to Andrew Ng's example. Um, I mean, he used a 1024 dimensional space and 5000 images and uh, they were projected onto a 100 dimensional subspace and now you see the dimension of the subspace is much smaller than the number of data and so here we have an overdetermined problem which we uh, we can we can solve with our methods with, with uh, quite good accuracy and stability and I mean that's the reason why here in this example the structure of the data can be conserved. Huh? And if we and, and it would be a nice experiment to look how it would work with uh, one megapixel data. And I guess the structure wouldn't be conserved very well. Yes, I mean we will we 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 would get real computational problems. Huh? Um, yeah, actually, no, but the covariance matrix, let me see. Oh yes, it would be a one million times one million matrix and the number of entries in the covariance matrix would be um, the square of one million, which we would be something like 10 to the power of 12 entries in the covariance matrix. Uh, so uh, that would be a severe problem. And calculating the, or solving the eigenvalue problem for such a large matrix, it, uh, it, gives, it has cubic complexity. So it's the cube of 10 to the power 12 which is actually really, really, really bad. Maybe if, I, I guess the covariance matrix would be very sparse and maybe there are some advanced techniques, but this is nothing for a little exercise. Huh? Okay, yeah, we can finish here, thank you.